first part of my videos because you have no idea why this guy is trying to do classes on a streaming service for games. I don't know. I don't have any good answers for you. It's just the way it's worked out so far. Anyway, what we're talking about is working memory, which is basically just short-term memory, which is a really important attribute of your brain. Um, it, it factors pretty heavily into IQ. Um, so IQ is part pattern recognition, essentially. But then it's also, uh, one could think equal parts, short-term memory. And the reason that is, and if you're a computer person, you might think of it as um, your CPU plus your RAM. And the RAM is important. So the more RAM you have, the more things you can load up into your short-term memory and the, there's more for your CPU to work with, right? So working memory is a, is a really important part of the human brain because it's, it's really ends up being our biggest limitation a lot of times. Um, it ends up being a, one of our biggest bottlenecks. And it's not something that's, <clears throat> just stuck that way. So last time in part two, we talked about how we could improve it, get better at it. And to summarize that really quickly, uh, it's essentially just practicing in the domain set that you want to get better at. So if you're, you know, you're playing first player shooters, practice those skill sequences. And once you practice them, they become more reflexive. They, you, they are sort of presented to your brain as options that, um, uh, if you push the button, that sequence of events will occur because you, they're almost reflexive to you at that point. So that, at that point, the the blackboard of your brain, which is how I like to refer to working memory, not unlike this thing over here, has a limited amount of space. And if we can have iconic representations of, of deeper uh, sequences or concepts, um, then we have more space to consider, you know, our options rather than if we say I have to detail this out, we might suck up our entire working memory, um, detailing that out because it, we haven't learned it that well. It's not reflexive. Um, uh, another example might be if you're in law school or you're a lawyer and you feel like you're, you know, I know, uh, I had some pre-law friends around me in college <clears throat> and they really like doing, uh, What's it called? Uh, mock, mock debate. Is that what it's called? Um, they. Um, just gonna... I was cold, and now I'm warm. Um, they uh, they did a lot of mock debate, and and so I don't know. Maybe you're in a situation like that, or something similar. You know, you're doing policy or government stuff, or I don't know. But let's do the law school thing for example, for, for a second. So maybe you find yourself losing debates all the time. Maybe you find yourself with these people who seem to have genius brains where they kind of pull these arguments out, run circles around you, are pretty calm about it. They don't seem overwhelmed. Um, and if you, and you get dragged down into the details of the of the argument like the the forest for the trees is the old metaphor right i'm gonna draw some trees i don't know how that's helping but the idea is you're so focused on on a tree that you can't zoom out and just see the whole thing it's just like a little forest in a in an area and that's really just a it's like a representation problem it's a it's it's the whole iconic uh icon representation thing we were just talking about um to that person, they're able to, they're like, oh yeah, there's a forest. And if I need to blow this up and look at all the different trees, I can do that. But it just sits as a, as a forest representation, representation in my head. And specifically, like if you're doing debates or something like that, it's it's the fact that they have these arguments well-practiced, that they, they know, you know, whatever law argument they have for arguing something is actually a federal uh, jurisdiction or state jurisdiction or whatever it is. I don't, I don't really, listen to much law stuff, but um, they have the, say, two solid arguments and maybe the one weaker argument um, reflexively in their, in their brain. They don't have to, like, regenerate this. It's it's stored. You know, when they start thinking about this one, they start automatically accuse the other two. So there's no, um, there's no effort on that. So the whole thing gets packaged as 
like a federal rights argument on some particular issue or something. And so when they're debating somebody, whoops, this thing gets, just kind of sits along with some other angles they can strategically think about when they're, when they're debating with you, which is why they don't seem overwhelmed, why they seem calm, and some people will think they are seem highly intelligent or genius, but it's really just a working memory issue. So that's kind of a recap. Um, now you don't need to go back and watch those other two classes. Uh, we got a little more into like details and how that actually works in your brain, but that's all good. So today I just wanted to get into how working memory actually affects um, one is game design and two, uh, I guess more broadly your life. And I kind of, we, we kind of did that already, but I think the game design is a really good thing to, to talk about because it's a, it's, it's a controlled environment and, uh, but it's really complex still. Um, and if you can understand that metaphor example, you can understand it maybe broader in the context of your life. So. Uh, the example I like to think is if you are designing the game um, or you're really ambitious and you're a young lad or lassie and I don't know, maybe you're getting into like AI or machine intelligence or something like that and you and you think by 2030 we'll have AI that can design games. I, I've thought of this before. I think, I think that's kind of a cool concept. Uh, we're a little away from it yet, but one issue you'll have is... Um, you know, or if you do it more traditionally or the way they do it currently, if you're just designing it yourself, you're a game designer, is to make the experience obviously enjoyable for the players, right? And one way to, to make it not enjoyable is to actually, well, it's, it, it's it, there's, there's a spectrum. And on one side of the spectrum, you can go of making the player feel like they have no choice, that they're just clicking a button and then something random happens. You know, no sense of autonomy, no sense of influence. They're, they're not getting any input, right? There's no options. Um, and, and so famously this will be an RPG, which will show you like four dialogue options and they all kind of route to the same thing. And that if that keeps happening over time, you just, you sort of stop having fun because you realize it's all a facade. They're, they're, they're doing this like choose your own adventure model, but it's all fake. So the, the lack of, Autonomy is is a is a one way to um, destroy fun in video games. If you're a game designer, the other end is just as problematic as you overwhelm them with too many options. And and for someone like me, who I always want, you know, more options, more creativity, more input in my games. Um, this one doesn't seem like this one's harder for me to uh, accept. But um, but there's examples of this that you can think of that are pretty convincing. Like, I don't know if anybody here plays card games like Hearthstone, Magic the Gathering. Uh, but I don't know if you ever have these turns where, you know, like like in Magic the Gathering, there was these uh, single turn combo turns where you would, uh, from your deck, you would draw, like, you'd end up with like 20 cards in your hand. So normally you have seven cards. You start off with seven and you pretty much go down in size from as the game progresses because you keep using your cards up and you're you know unless you have a lot of draw mechanics anyway point is max hand of seven and seven makes sense because seven kind of like that magical number that paper we looked at um the guy who was obsessed with the number seven in the 50s because he he did all these short-term memory experiments and he kept seeing that human memory is seven plus or minus two roughly so it's kind of interesting because in magic the gathering for instance Seven cards is the max hand size and it's the number you start with. Um, in Hearthstone, I think you start with four cards, something like that, four or five, but you can you can drop to 10. So it's, it's you know, seven plus or minus three instead of two. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And it and really goes back to uh, working memory of humans and the limitations. and. And again, think of the example, and I don't know if maybe this doesn't apply to you, but if, you, if you've played these card games, think of the example where you pull off some cool combo and you're able to draw like 30 cards in your hand. It gets overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's partly because the, 
it's probably because of the combinatorics involved. But before we get into that, um, the simple way of saying it is it's too much to evaluate. It's too much to assess, right? I mean, so if you play like a new deck and you're reading every card and then you're drawing a lot of cards on top of it, it's overwhelming. Everybody's had this experience. Um, if you're in a game, um, this happens all the time. If you're in a, if you're in a game, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. But if you're if you're in another game, let's just finish the card game metaphor. So the card game metaphor is really easy because mathematically you can understand it. So if it was with seven cards, imagine you have enough mana in Magic or in Hearthstone you have enough. I guess it's mana as well, right? They both use mana, um, but whatever. You have enough points to play two cards. Um, combinatoric, combinatorically wise, you already have this many combinations. In, in that order, if the order matters, and if the order doesn't matter, it's it's a smaller number. But but in uh, but with so I don't know what that you know depending on whether the order matters or not. But you have you have some you know two digit combination already, which is pretty high. You you start you know you start drawing uh, twenty cards. You start getting closer to the four hundred combinations. It's just it in 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 a way you're evaluating the board state after you play one card and then the next card and with seven that's already it's already quite a bit but maybe you can reduce it maybe two of the cards in your hand are lands so you're like okay i i, I can either play those or i can't play those so i can ex exclude those and now i'm down to five you know so it's not really um this number and then there's some further restrictions you know and then you're you're only down to say like three cards and so then that's that's really just six combinations of which two cards you can play, something like that. That's fine, but again, when you when you blow it up to seven, or say twenty or thirty cards, you draw you draw like half your deck. You can understand um, the overwhelming uh, uh, situation you find yourself in. It's interesting because if you if you work with good game designers, they're very cognizant of this, and so what they do is they. You, you might see this done poorly sometimes, like there's a game, they build a game, and then they tack on a tutorial, right? And the tutorial seems kind of tacked on. Um, and so, uh, you know, this could be as simple as like, here's the controls, right? Um, you know, here's the move, and then now here's the jump, and here's the attack, here's the defend, here's some special abilities. All right, go play. Good game design, like really good high level game design, they see the whole game as just a continuing tutorial. So what they're doing is like, you have all these basic abilities. Now, what com you know combinations or ways can we combine them to do more like emergent behavior? Let's show you a few of those emergent ones. Now let's show you what happens in these and take one of these and show you what happened in different uh, situations. If you're in this situation or this situation, you're in this situation, different things happen, you know? And, and so the whole game is layered as a layered tutorial. So in a lot of ways, you know, I, I like game designers because they're these intuitive um, teachers, really. I mean, they really understand human learning. They understand the capacities of, of being either overwhelmed or being disengaged because there's really nothing to engage in. And there's nothing really going on that you can have input. There's no sense of autonomy. So. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it re it's really very relevant to game design. So if you if you have game design, you have to think about at all these stages kind of what what's new. So what are they what do they have to now learn and turn into more sequence memory, more rote? You know what are they learning currently, and what have they already learned that you can take advantage of to give them options? And is the combination of these overwhelming? The, their working memory capacity, um, or you know, is it not even loaded, taxing it at all? It's so low um, that there's there's really no sense of input or autonomy. So anyway, I think I think that's uh, one way which working memory, which you know, the cognitive concept really ties into uh, game design, gameplay. And if you're not on the design side of it, you're just sort of a a user who's trying to get better at this stuff. You need to be uh, cognizant that if you're feeling this end of the spectrum over here, you're feeling very overwhelmed, you may have progressed 
too far and you might just need to step back a little bit and work on something. And maybe the designers didn't do a good job. So you have to take, you know, you realize it's this level that you haven't um, well integrated or mapped in your mind. So you have to kind of take this, break it down and just really just be very simplistic about it and take like two or three elements um, or just start with one and, and realize what you need to get better at. And once you, once you break each one of these down and you, and you practice them and you get better at it, whether it's a law argument, uh, whether it's arguing for one piece of a broader law argument, whether you're in a um, RPG or FPS game, um, you know, just step back, make sure you, you map these, get these down rote, and then they become, they become options. They become uh, accessible to you as, as, as a, something that can help you rather than something that's just overwhelming your working memory. Um, so basically, I mean, one way to think about the working memory is it's the space where, um, especially if you're in a new space, it's a space of, of, it's a space where you're throwing up things that you don't know that well. You know, it's, it's like your to-do list on your uh, fridge. Um, you don't put things on your fridge that you do every day. You don't have to put like get dressed, brush your teeth on your fridge. That's kind of rote already, but you're like, oh, I need to get a new, whatever, uh, something broke and I need to get a new faucet handle or something. That is kind of what working members, it's for the novel stuff that isn't, isn't rote and, and practiced. And, and if you haven't, say you keep walking out of the house without pants on, um, you might make a note to yourself on your fridge, put pants on, and, and then you will do that until it becomes rote. You don't need to use the space in your fridge anymore to say, put pants on, so. So that's good. I'm glad I've made it relevant to all the people who have a problem putting pants on before they go out. I'm glad I have uh, really captured a broad problem all right, so I think that was mostly it. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, really if you, the feeling of being overwhelmed emotionally sometimes could be your working memory being overloaded. And it's kind of, sometimes it's called cognitive overload. Uh, there's a lot of things for it, but it's really just, it's really, you know, if you think of the, I'll draw my, my brain here. Um, let's clear this out. Uh, so if I, if I go back to my beautiful Picasso drawing of my brain, um, you have the prefrontal cortex, which is a lot of um, kind of attention stuff we're talking about. Um, it, it, it's, and then, and then in, inside you have, the, you have the brain stem, which is sort of kind of keeping an eye on everything on your, in your body and everything else. Um, if, and, and it's linked with a lot of um, kind of emotional centers, although a lot of this is, is still not well understood. I mean, emotions are probably really distributed, to be honest. The point is, if, if, if your brain is consistently overwhelmed and your own brain can't figure out it's overwhelmed, your emotional system might be, might be feeling uh, frustrated, overwhelmed, there might be different emotions that um, your brainstem sort of um, smartly trying to signal to you. And so if you're feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, um, it, it, might be a, it, it, might be, it might be an issue with sort of the blackboard of your mind being overwhelmed all the time, that you're, 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 um, the blackboard or the to-do list on your fridge is, is absolutely cluttered. And we talked about some techniques for decluttering that in the last stream, and we, we'll cover that again in the future. Uh, but the point is, you know, you know, you should, I mean, one way to t reframe it is to feel happy that, that um, you have a sign that you might know what the problem is. And it might be that, you know, maybe you're being overwhelmed or faced with too many decisions, or um, maybe you only have a perception of two decisions, but the details of each side of the uh, decision are, have so many overwhelming details 
you haven't figured out a way to reduce them and keep them all in mind as you try to as you try to balance the two if that makes any sense um you know so that if you're um because really a, a lot of what the brain is doing is trying to condense things down to smaller representations so if it's like for instance you have i don't know move away for a job stay in a stay in the same place and then a lot of these is like people you know um that you like being around uh some sort of rent situation that you don't want to deal with you know you know moving you don't you don't have to move uh there might be some other opportunities around you et cetera, et cetera. and then the job situations like new city uh pay is good you know you know, on and on and on you know it's it's hard to have all this in your mind and then weigh this all all at once so often what you need to do is figure out patterns or strategies for reducing these things so it's like it's like okay this you know this this and this i need to do different colors because i am overwhelming my own um this this and say this are, are really just lifestyle things and and you try to come up with a collapsed representation of how much all these things mean to you in terms of um quality of life of your lifestyle you know and this might be you know uh future opportunities uh sacrifices you're making now for future quality of life you know collapsing it is important because really honestly because the working memory capacity of your brain is pretty limited so if you if you constantly have this overwhelmed your uh your brain stem might be kicking in giving you um emotions um 